immediately after as a personal injury lawyer. Before I go into a little bit more about myself, I will answer the question, if it weren't for John Jay, I wouldn't be in law school. And the reason why I say that is because I am very much uh, the type of person who is able to get things done as, soon, as long as I have my to-do list. How do I get there? And But for John Jay and having these law days, which is actually what helped me create that to-do list of what I had to get together in order for me to apply to law school, um, I wouldn't have uh, followed that path. Uh, with that being said, I'm also the vice president of the Puerto Rican Bar Association. Uh, Stephen Cordero, who introduced himself in a moment, he's also on our executive board. He's the VP. And I could see we have our president, Jesus Zeno, here as well. And I bring that up because um, the Puerto Rican Bar Association has played a huge role in terms of where I am now in terms of giving back to our community and helping our youth follow the path that, uh, that I was fortunate enough to be able to do so. Um, so with that being said, um, I'll pass it along to the next. Thank you. Rosemarin. Hi, everyone. My name is Rosemarin Belliard. I'm very happy to be on this panel speaking with you all. I recall just a few years ago being in your shoes. So I, I commend everyone first and foremost before I get into my introduction about just, uh, just being here today. Um, so I'm an associate attorney at Fragman Del Rey, Burnson & Lowy. It's a corporate immigration law firm. I went to John Jay and graduated in May of 2013. Uh, later on, I went on to New York Law School, uh, graduating in 2017, and then I've been with uh, Fragman really since I've graduated. Um, I practice in the corporate uh, immigration arena exclusively. It's a very specialized area within immigration law, and um, I, get in, I could get into more details on just uh, the intricacies of that, um, especially in, in light of this administration, but uh, if it weren't for John Jay, I would not have discovered the sense of purpose that I have, uh, not just for my career, but for who I am as a person. I had a very positive experience at John Jay. I made meaningful relationships. I, I was able to, uh, I was encouraged to, to take on internships and experiences that I really think developed and helped me uh, become the person that I am today. So. I'm forever indebted and I hope that today uh, we can offer some advice to you all who are here um, to help you in your own journeys. Thank you so much. Steven? Steven, you might have to unmute. Oh, you're unmuted. Go ahead. Okay. No, all right, great, thank you. Thank you, Roseanne, that was a little bit of playing uh, who, who can I move whom. Uh, anyway, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's great to be here. Once again, I'm Steven Cordero. I am a litigation partner at Ackerman LLP, an AM Law 100 law firm with offices throughout the country. I'm a litigation partner in a New York office doing what is called commercial litigation. I represent businesses, firms, and their legal disputes. And as Laura had said, I'm the president-elect of the Puerto Rican Bar Association. Uh, you know, working with Laura and our president Jesus, and next year I'll be the 64th president of the organization. Uh, this, what I owe to John Jay, I owe so many different things, but I'll, I'll do a little different uh, than others. If it wasn't for John Jay, I wouldn't have met my wife. And last week we celebrated our 18th wedding anniversary. Woo congrats! Thank you. Uh, she's a John Jay alum, also. So it obviously, without John Jay, my whole my life would have been completely different, and I, and I owe a, a great at that. It's gratitude to the institution. That's wonderful. I can't wait to hear that love story at another time. And by by the way, a little plug. I was actually featured on John Jay. Thank you. Uh, last fall on Alumni Spotlight, uh, which it should still be up on their website. Uh, but I'll, I'll I'll tell you all a little about it, the story. Is your wife Ruby Cordero? No, no, she's oh. a different name. It's uh, Betsy Morales. Okay. Cordero. Okay, okay, cool. Um, Soila. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Soila Del Castillo. 
Um, I'm a prosecutor or assistant attorney general at the office of the attorney general. I'm in the Criminal Enforcement and Financial Crimes Bureau. So I prosecute and investigate complex financial crimes. Um, I graduated from John Jay in 2010, and it seems like so long ago, but um, uh, it's not. And I'm very fond of my experiences at John Jay, and I'm very happy to be here to share my experience with you. Um, I went on to go to law school at Wayne State University Law School, which is located in Detroit. Um, I was blessed to be part of the um, Ronald H. Brown program at John Jay, mm -hmm. which uh, at that time it was being hosted at St. John's University. I think that's still the case today. Um, so for two years, they prepped me in order to like shape me to pick the best, the best school that was the best choice for me. So that's how I ended up in uh, Detroit. Um, before working at the AG's office, I was also working at the uh, Brooklyn District Attorney's office for over four years, where I also prosecuted crimes. Um, I, I am involved with bar association work. Um, I'm involved in quite a few of them. I'm the chair of the Hispanic National Bar Association, Young Lawyers Division for New York. I'm also involved with the Dominican Bar Association. I'm on the board uh, of the DBA. And I'm also in the uh, junior executive board of the Latino Justice Pro Def nonprofit. Um, it's called the Leaders Board. So I do a lot of work with the education committee, such as the Next Generation Leaders, um, which I'll be happy to share more information with you guys. I think it will be a great um, idea to also like check out the programs that they have available for aspiring lawyers. Um, and uh, so, so that's my work with um, um, bar associations. And um, I, to answer the question, where would I be if it wasn't for John Jay? Um, I think if it wasn't for John Jay, I would not have had the hands-on experience that I had that made me a well-rounded applicant for law school. By the time that I applied to law school, I was fortunate enough, just like my Rosemarine mentioned, that I had a lot of like work experience because I was able to do a lot of internships and I was also able to work full-time when, when I was in uh, attending John Jay. Uh, so that helped me on to get to law school and has also helped me throughout my career now. So um, I'm very grateful for that experience. Thank you so much, Soila. Let's continue with you since you're on a roll. Um, did you always know you wanted to be a lawyer or did the desire come to you later in life? And if you can also tell the audience what your major was, someone is curious about it in the uh, chat. So I think I knew I wanted to be a lawyer at a very young age. Um, and I'm, I think I'm gonna say like, even before high school. Um, but when I was in high school, it was when I finally like decided this is the career path that I want to take on. And I know that that may be early on for some people, but it's never late, obviously. Um, but I was doing a college now program. It was back then, I'm, I'm not sure if it's around today. It was the Serrano internship program. And um, it allowed us to take political science college courses at CUNY schools. Um, I was able to get college credits, but also they placed us in an internship during the summer. And one of those internship was at the office of the attorney general at the Harlem regional office. Um, and I have come full circle because since then I knew that that's where I wanted to be when I became a lawyer. Um, and I had great mentors who have taken me on and mentored me since I was in high school, um, helped me get into law school and told me exactly what I needed to do in order to pursue a career as a prosecutor at the AG's office. That's so funny. that's, um, people tell me that's like a great story to hear. Um, but I think that goes to say that, you know, I knew early on what I wanted to do and I put it into practice. So that's how I, I ended up working where I'm working today. So that's how your major. What was your major? My major in college was political science. Back then it was government. And I also had minors in Latin America and Latino stories. And then um, 
history. Oh. Um, yeah, so but some popular majors back then was also the uh, legal, um, legal studies. Yeah, legal studies. Yeah, but I, I did government back then. How about you, Stephen? Did you always want to do this, and what was your major? Yeah, actually, mine was completely different. Actually, I didn't mention uh, I'm a little of the ancient ones in here. I got I graduated in uh, 1996. <laughs> My, I never actually grew up, I wanted to be a lawyer. I, I could draw, I could paint, I want to be a comic book artist. Uh, but the uh, good the Puerto Rican parents I had, they were like, no way, you have to be constructive with your talent. <laughs> so I went to right across the street to New York Institute of Technology to become an architect major. Uh, but in 19, what happened was the financial aid system uh, changed and I had to drop out because even though I was an A student, I couldn't afford. And back then, uh, they needed to have, if I wanted to do student loans, is a per have my parents be guarantors of the loans. And, you know, they had lived, the, you know, quote, quote, the American dream. They had a house. They bought it in the Bronx. Uh, they moved out of the projects. And I was like, I was not going to do that to them. So I joined the Army for the GI Bill. And uh, the recruiters showed me these videos of <clears throat> what they call common engineers, uh, building things, constructing things. Oh, that's great. That's what I'm going to totally do. Unfortunately, it wasn't true at all. I ended up blowing things up, uh, uninstalling and installing mines. And when I was stationed in Korea, I had fallen off of a, a, a truck. I was a, what is called an APC driver, armored personnel carrier. And we had to do maintenance on everybody's vehicle. And, I, and during winter, we were doing maintenance and I had fallen off. It was about 18 feet in the air. And I uh, got medevaced out and I lost the use of my hands. So the first time when I was three years old, I couldn't draw. So I had to figure out what I was gonna do. But if you're in the military they, and you could walk uh, or at least semi-walk, they put you to work. So I was put on overnight guard duty. And there uh, I was put in the commander's office overnight guard duty. He was going to law school. So I started reading the law books and it was many, you know, it just blew my mind. It was the idea of, you know, uh, knowing the law, knowing, the, uh, knowing your rights, and knowing how so many things are impacting the law. And I decided, you know what, I'm gonna go to law school. And I, just, I fell in love with the law, uh, and my goal was at, at, after I got hurt and I was recovering to get my associates when I was in the army to show that I actually can do something. And back then there was no such thing as online classes, uh, so I, we actually had a, uh, I had to go through classes whenever I was not during my, uh, uh, my, uh, my training tours when I was in Korea and eventually in Georgia. And then I got my associates and then I was looking at different, uh, colleges for a pre-law program. And it's funny how you think about things. Uh, I was out of, you know, everybody I knew had already graduated by 1994 or on the path to graduate. And I was like, I have to do this fast. And I saw that John Jay had, what at the time, was legal studies. And that's what I majored in, of course, not anymore, but that was the big thing. And, and, that's what, and, and it just like it fed my love of, of the law and wanted to be a lawyer. And, and similar to Zyla, I actually, back then, what they had is a, I had a minor in Puerto Rican studies. And so when I was in John Jay, that was, that was the period in which so many different interests grew in, in the law. And we were very active because that was also during the era of Governor Pataki and Mayor Giuliani. And there was a lot of fights in the, from CUNY against them about the budget cuts and everything else. So, and, and that also became of uh, the interest. And so then eventually what I wanted to, and I realized like, where would I want to do in the law? And I, and I see that there's many different ways and some people who look like us who were who not, and I was like, you know what, I wanna do civil law, and I wanna do, uh, I wanna do litigate, because I love, it does the two things I love. I love competition, and I love sports, and I love, I'm creative. And being a litigator allows me to craft stories, to uh, fight against somebody else, and how well can I tell the story, and how well I can uh, convince somebody. And it, it is best, it's, it's, like, it's live theater, and I enjoyed it ever since, and I've been doing it for 20 years. Thank you for sharing that. Wow, that's quite the story. Thank you. Laura? Yes, yeah, so for me, it, it was a bit different as well. I, as a child, my parents instilled in me the importance of getting a higher education. And so I knew I had to go to college. Now, what I was going to do in college, I wasn't sure until I was about 
in my junior year in high school. I went to John Bond High School in Queens. And at the time I wanted to be a detective. So I applied to John Jay College of Criminal Justice and I figured I would get my four years a bachelor's and then become police officer and work my way up to being a detective. I like investigative work, so I figured I could do that. My senior year in high school, I started working as a filing clerk at a law firm. And while I was in the law firm, I translated a lot for the attorneys and the clients during their meetings. And that went on for about, well, the entire time I was there until now, I'm still at the same firm. I'm actually transitioning soon mm -hmm. to a new firm, but um, that's been what, 13 years. And when I was there, I saw that through translation, what the attorneys were doing. Again, it's not something that came to mind like, oh, I could be a lawyer because I grew up in Corona, Queens. My family had, my parents had migrated to New, well, had migrated to the United States from Peru. And um, the working people, we did not have any, any lawyers in the family, no lawyers in my parents' inner circle, no one that I could say, oh, they're a lawyer, I could become a lawyer too. So when I was working at the firm, that's the first time I had a chance to see what lawyers did in a certain field, it was personal injury work. But um, again, that was just kind of like the seed that was planted. Um, but then when I was at John Jay, like I mentioned, I went to a law day. And then from the law day, there were these other events that were taught that would inform you on what you had to do if you wanted to become a lawyer. Now, I was an A student as well. I, I believe when I graduated, my GPA, GPA was like a 3.89, something like that. And I only bring it up because with that, with that average, I still didn't think about the possibility of me becoming a lawyer. I just thought it was far-fetched until, again, I looked at the, the bullet points of what I had to get together to apply to law school. And so I went into um, John Jay with a criminal justice, uh, starting a criminal justice major. And after a year and a half of being in, I switched my major to justice studies. At the time, that was the major that John Jay would promote for students that wanted to go to law school because they had a combination of courses of history, philosophy, and English. I also did a dual minor. I minored in English and I minored in philosophy. And I focused in those courses because I wanted to get my writing skills and my critical thinking skills up to par to become a, a good a law student and to be able to compete with other students uh, once I got there. And um, so that's what I did. I changed routes while I was at John Jay and I can't say that I'm not, you know, I couldn't be happier with that. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Thank you. And Rosemary, last but not least. <laughs> Thanks. Um, so I majored in political science and I did a minor in history. Um, I have always had a very deep sense of civic responsibility and um, I feel like my experience and my, my awareness of whether or not I wanted to be a lawyer wasn't clear until I got to John Jay. Um, growing up, very similar to Laura's story, my, um, I had the, the child of immigrant experience. So, uh, if many of you who are here are, are children of immigrants, we have this shared experience, right, where we are from a very early age given a lot of responsibility. Uh, we are carrying the aspirations and dreams of our parents who left their country behind to uh, find the American dream here and give us a better life. Uh, couple that with the reality that, you know, as the child of immigrant born in the United States, we're the ones who are accustomed to uh, the culture and the society. And in a way, from a very early age, we, we become responsible for translating that culture for our parents. Um, translating uh, goes even further from the culture, goes to translating documents, uh, legal documents, sometimes bills, laws, before you are even in, you know, know the words, what the words mean. Um, so I think that uh, inevitably I would have found my way um, to becoming an advocate, a gatekeeper, a solver, a problem solver, a fixer, those kind of things that uh, children of immigrants relate to and our skills that are transferable and um, that I see in what I'm doing now. Um, but before um, you know, coming to the clear confirmation of pursuing a law degree, I went to John Jay and I met the very first attorney that I've ever known. Um, it, you know, her name was Via Cajones. She was the director of the Pre-Law Institute and she took me under her wing. 
uh, basically we worked on creating a blueprint of what my experience would be like, how to develop as a very strong JD applicant. So the courses that I took, um, logic games, everything was strategically part of this plan to get me to my end goal, which was becoming, you know, getting into law school. Your end goal changes as you go through the journey, but during my time at John Jay, my end goal was get into, get into law school. And um, with her guidance and with the guidance and support of my professors from the political science department, which all were uh, sort of directing me to pursue a PhD. Um, and thankfully, I was able to stick to uh, my vision of uh, continuing my work with immigration. So um, the experience that I, I saw my parents going through um, when I was growing up, I knew that it wasn't unique to like my family. I saw it around in my community. I saw it all over the city, uh, you know, immigrant communities, especially in New York City, such a diverse place, they have difficulty integrating into the social fabric. And, and that's just one part. Now, if we take a look at, you know, their access to legal resources, that, that, that shows uh, really just like the deficiencies that are in the immigration arena from a federal and state and city level. So I, you know, wanted to stay in that area and I've never changed my mind. I've never deviated from immigrant work. Um, it's, it developed a bit after uh, John Jay. I went on to uh, participate, participate in a, a program called the Urban Fellows Program. And I worked for nine months in the mayor's office of immigrant affairs, uh, which is a very specialized office where they connect basically uh, the resources and services that are available in New York City to various immigrant groups throughout the city. Um, in my work there, those super fulfilling and rewarding and very, very meaningful work, I still was able to see how immigration issues cannot be addressed on a local level. So that was, you know, that's been my vision. Um, fixing that, uh, being part of immigration reform, being part of uh, this space of uh, immigrant community that very much need people to advocate on their behalf. Immigration law is such a complex system. So I feel like, you know, the, the role that I had in my family's life and my parents' life, I still apply it and I still see how it's, it's, it's what I'm, I've, I've been doing throughout this journey and in my work now uh, as a corporate immigration lawyer. Um, and just briefly context on what corporate immigration law is, because I feel like a lot of people have questions about it. It's not, um, you know, what's covered in the mainstream media right now. There's a lot of attention on the DACA population now that the Supreme Court is determining the future of that status. Um, and family-based, you know, the undocumented population seems to be um, the hot topic for, for this administration. But um, what I do is legal immigration. So um, I advise multinational corporations on uh, employment-based matters from the immigrant, non-immigrant perspective. Um, I basically assist American companies in their ability to stay competitive. Uh, as we all know, the, the, the future of this country, the future of the American economy really depends on American businesses being able to stay at the forefront of innovation and policy. So um, my client is specifically a, a technology company, uh, very um, at the center of scientific development. So um, in assisting them by bringing foreign skilled workers here to the US, um, I contribute not only to like an individual's life, but um, businesses um, you know, on a federal level. Um, and you know, I, I still feel like it's the same thing I've been doing my, you know, throughout this whole journey. It's just developed and um, transformed along the way. Thank you so much for that, Rosemarin. I'm pleased to see, based on the chat, that we have a couple of seniors in high school who dialed in, and they have some really, really good questions that I think maybe some of the undergrads might also have, and they are really interested in getting into law school. So, for example, how important are the LSATs? What do you have to do to prepare what is the workload like for dual programs? A couple of people in the chat talked about different dual programs that are offered at various colleges and universities. So whatever insights you have into your early journey into trying to get into law school, I think will be helpful for some of our young people who I'm amazed and I think you guys are amazing just for even being here, listening in on this conversation. It means that you are trying to figure it out and prepare 
so that you know what to do. So kudos to you. Um, I want to start with Soila. Um, I think um, everyone has to touched on, on, on this and mentioned this, but obviously getting hands-on experience definitely helps you, not only as a student, but also as a professional um, while in law school and later on. Um, I took advantage of a lot of programs at John Jay, and I'm very grateful to them. Um, internship programs, the Edward T. Rogoski internship, which um, I, I did the uh, Women's Caucus, which partnered us up with uh, city council members, and I interned for Christine Queens, the speaker of the city council. I also did the assembly uh, internship through the Edward T. Rogoski program. Meanwhile, while I was taking advantage of all those internships, I also worked part-time at the Attorney General's office um, for my entire, uh, my entire time at John Jay. So I was building up my experience because I knew that I wanted to go to law school. So the things that um, my mentors always told me, and I will specifically say the Ronald H. Brown program, um, Jody Rory, who is in charge of that program, always mentioned to all the students, the one thing that you can control right now is your GPA and your experience. So whatever happens during the LSAT, you know, it's a one day thing. It doesn't determine who you are going to be as an attorney. And it's, it's, it's a very tough exam for most people. Um, so if you can take the time that you have throughout your three years or four years in college to develop your other credentials, uh, keeping up a very high GPA, I had a very high GPA, thankfully, um, so I didn't have to worry about that aspect when I was applying to law school, but I always maintained that GPA high for that reason. Um, and working in all of those offices, when it came time to submit my application to law school, I had really great letters of recommendation from reputable offices. Um, but at the end of the day, I also build relationships with those people that I worked for. Um, until this day, the, some of the people that I work for at the AG's office are still my mentors. Uh, and I've maintained that relationship throughout law school. So I would say control what you can, which is your GPA. Um, and taking advantage of all these internship opportunities because one of the great things about being at John Jay is that it is a commuter school, but you can use that to your advantage because while you're going to school, you can also be doing internships throughout the day. Um, and it was tough. For me, it was hard. Um, I'm not sure why I was in such a rush, but to me, it was important to just get things done. And that's how I always like lift um, my life even academically and professionally. Um, I completed my degree within three years um, and I applied right after to law school. So when I got to law school, I was 20 and I had gotten accepted to law school when I was 19. I don't recommend it. This does not have to be your path. I wish maybe I may have taken a year off, but it worked for me because I never had a break. Um, and even when it came to the bar, I don't envy those people who take a break because when things are fresh in your mind, you just want to kind of like push through it. Um, so it may have been a lot to do it within six years, all of it, but I, I managed to do that. Um, and regarding the LSAT exam, I didn't do so well in the LSAT, but because everything else, I was a social well-rounded applicant at the time. I think I didn't have any problems getting into law school, but most importantly for me, as many of the speakers mentioned as well, I'm a first generation immigrant. My family came from the Dominican Republic and settled in the South Bronx. I was lucky to go to a new school. Um, uh, that it was sort of like a shatter school um, in Riverdale, which you know I had to learn like three languages, including Japanese. I don't even know anything about Japanese. Um, but I was lucky to take advantage of those opportunities and build my resume and build my experience. Um, so the LSAT exam was not the end of it all. Um, and it was important to me to get financial help um, because my family did not have the resources to pay for me to go to law school. They didn't even understand the fact that I was going away for law school, uh, but it was important for me to get a, a scholarship. And in my case, I got a full scholarship, thank 
thankfully, and I say this because I always recommend what my mentors told me, follow the money, kind of like go where the money is, especially back in 2010, it was a really bad economy. Um, I knew that I wanted to do public interest. Um, so for me to go into law school was a gamble at the time. Um, but I was lucky enough to get a full scholarship. I went to a school that was specialized in public interest and I was fortunate to graduate in 2013 with minimal loans. So yeah, I, I, that's my recommendation. Work on your LSAT, do a lot of like extracurricular activities, internships, and worry about the, um, the LSAT later. It will be a one day thing. You may or may not do well, but at the end of the day, you have, you have done everything else that you possibly could. Thank you so much for that. And if I could summarize that a little bit, you're basically saying you need to be well-rounded, right? We stress Absolutely. about these standardized tests, but the reality is that admissions folks really want well-rounded people coming into their schools and the GPA is important. And that, and I love what you said, these are the things you can control. You can control the internships you get, you can control your GPA people studying and doing what you have to do to get there. And that is such valuable advice. Thank you so much. Um, Laura, folks have been saying, you mentioned that you've been working in this law firm since the beginning. And do you think that that is a place for our young people to look for part-time jobs while they're in school, um, no matter what they're doing in those offices? Or are there other types of work that they could be looking into that are equally valuable. Laura, that's for you. You're muted. Okay, how about? There you go. So okay. I didn't realize that we have to be allowed back in. So, okay, so I'll, I'll, I'll start off by saying this. When I started working at the firm, I started off as a filing clerk. So it had nothing to do in terms of working on a memo or research for the lawyers, not at all. I was a filing clerk for about two years to three years. And I was doing that because I was working part-time and going full-time um, to John Jay. And I did that throughout my entire four years. And I think it's very important. Well, for one, we needed the, I needed the income. But second, it allowed me to continue gaining experience at the firm by seeing what others did. And I always volunteered to do other things outside of being a filing clerk. Mm -hmm. So eventually throughout my um, 13 years at the firm, I held every single position in that firm. I ended up being a legal assistant, then legal secretary, a paralegal for a paralegal that had to go on maternity leave. So she taught me what to do. And I, I remember for once a full summer, I was able to take on her load of cases. And um, then I became a liens negotiator uh, because I had to go back to school. And so I worked, by the way, at Elliot Efraimoff and Associates. And so Elliot said, okay, what can we do to keep you on, but you could still work part-time? He showed me how to negotiate liens. From there, I was, uh, so, so I would negotiate high medical bills, other, all types of liens. So I picked up on my negotiation skills there. I then, when I went, I, I did a medical records review. So I would look at, um, all these types of medical records, learn how to digest them. Then I did calendar clerk. And so I would set up, make confirm hearings, who would attend, um, who would go to court appearances. And so there was a lot of interaction between me, the attorneys, and also these outside companies. Uh, for example, if I had to hire a court reporter for a case or an interpreter. Um, so I was constantly engaging with people within the field and understanding how the practice worked. When I went into law school, I came back during the winter break and then I was uh, doing, then I started doing research memos. And then I came back in an externship doing trial work with one of the trial attorneys. And that's how I ended up gaining great mentors in that field, trying my own cases when I came back. And my understanding is that in the personal injury firm from the plaintiff's side, you don't really get thrown into trying cases because these are real clients that can, you cannot afford to lose the case, basically. Granted, I started off with the cases that nobody wanted or that you were expected to lose. These cases where you would advise the clients, look, you're better off settling. The client makes the last call. They did not want to settle. Okay, try the case. And I got, you know, because I think maybe I didn't have the pressure of winning the case, I put in so much work into like my first two cases that I was expected to lose. Even my mentor told me, 
Laura, there's nothing to lose when you have lost. And then, and the liability was the issue in my first case. And then I got a full verdict in my client's favor. And when you get that, you start realizing like, wow, you put in the time, you put in the effort and things come out the way you would like them to come out. So I share that because, and I share that in my experience with that firm because I held, I held onto so many different positions there that essentially it helped me become the person I am today. And I could have held those positions in different places. I could have worked at a medical office doing medical records. I could have worked at a collections company negotiating bills or trying to get bills paid, things of that nature. So um, I would say a law firm is not the only place where you could gain this experience, but it's certainly a place that I would promote getting at least maybe for one semester, uh, just so you get a feel of what you uh what the practice is like another place will be in the courtrooms for example you have judges that will take students for internships externships and they're they want to teach younger folks what the field is like so that way you know what you would have to do if if you're a lawyer if you want to be a litigator or you think you may want to be a litigator get an internship in a courtroom um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm with the um, on the board of the Puerto Rican Bar Association, and there are a couple of judges on the board, and they constantly they're they're helping out younger folks get those internships. And so, for the students here, if you want to be a lawyer or you think you want to be a lawyer and you're not sure, get in there and see what the field is like. Another thing, if you don't have time, I know someone mentioned in the chat that they they are unable to balance well between work and full time. The courtrooms are open for everyone. Any time of the day, they have night court, day court. If you want to see what the courtroom is really like, trust me, it's not like law and order because that's what I thought it was like and that's why I wanted to become a detective. But um, go in there and see what, you know, what trials are about, if that's something you think you want to do. I've learned that, at least for me, I learned by watching and getting firsthand experience. So if you don't have the flexibility to get that type of job into your schedule just walk into a courtroom and you get it for free so laura are you saying that these courtrooms are open to the public i'm it's not sure that everybody knows that yes and that's actually a great point i didn't know that myself the courtrooms are open to the public so each and every one of you who are in this chat right now if you wanted to go well not now but when the courts open up again you could go just like i said they have the night court they have day court just find a, a courtroom and when you go in you could ask the security guard if there are any trials going on if that's something you're interested in watching and they will let you know what george uh, what judge what part has an ongoing trial and you could pay them a visit i've done it um, also for arraignments you go in there you see what it's like it's different from the court different from civil court so you could go into both types of courtrooms and see what that's like to get the to just become aware of what the field is like you know, this is excellent. What I'm hearing from all four of you as an underlying theme is work ethic. You got to take that extra step to ask for extra work. You got to take that extra step to read those law books when you're night security. You got to get those extra internships. You have to take the leap and leave New York City and potentially go to law school in Detroit. Like, are there any Dominicans in Detroit, right? So I know that's scary. <laughs> that's one of the things um, my colleagues will tell you. I'm always complaining about the fact that young people do not want to leave New York City. <laughs> I just want to say something with that. I actually, I was one of those. So I stayed in New York throughout uh, undergrad, law school, but I will say because I did that, when I went to St. John's, they had a travel, um, a summer abroad program. Mm -hmm. And so, because I somewhat regretted it at that point, I thought, you know, I should have gotten out of the city, but because one, we didn't have um, the, well, I thought about, you know, not having the finances to, to be able to do that. But when I went to law school, that was my last chance, which, which I thought was my last chance. I said, okay, let me study abroad. It was for a summer. They had a, a I, I went to Paris for the summer and I studied there. But you're right, you're totally right. If you could go out and do that, I, I recommend it as well. And if you do go away to, for law school, you can always come back to New York and you will That's be right. fine. It's That's the same right. curriculum. You can get internships during the summer. You can build those connections during the summer. So you will be fine if you leave. So Stephen, I wanted to talk a little bit with you because I know some folks in the chat are asking two unrelated but unrelated. One, how to get internships, particularly in law firms, 
Um, I know that you've been in Ackerman for a while and you're a partner, so maybe you can give us some insight. And also, what about the crisis we're in now and getting internships in this environment? Do you have any tips? Do you have any advice for, for our young graduating students, the cl poor class of 2020? My heart goes out to them. They're losing their internships or you know, internships are frozen. So is there anything creative being done in law firms like yours? And uh, yeah, that's a great uh, question, uh, Roseanne. It, it, it is, of course, we have to be real. Uh, law firms, a lot of them who are in the large firm, law firms like myself, they are in a, in a financial crunch. And so a lot of uh, financial decisions are being made. However, of course, your life doesn't go on pause. So the thing is, it, it goes a couple of different ways, is the, a lot of what they do also to is your school, think of you John Jay, or if you're in law school, do the career planning or things of that nature, to look for postings or any information about internships or about things of that nature that could be posted and, and then you can actually outreach to them uh, and see about it because that's, the information is always coming out and so forth, and there's different opportunities on there. Now, the thing is also too is, another thing about being the reality, because I just, from my experience, I did some internships when I was in law school, but I was broke. So I ended up being a law clerk at a law firm because they were paying me. And so that was a small law firm and a law that I didn't want to, uh, that I wasn't interested in, but it gave me granular experience. And it's, uh, it was called as admiralty law. It's basically labor law of the sea. But it was just fascinating to do it. And I was got uh, to be able to do little things on there. And then also I was able to do an internship at PBS. So I was interested in uh, uh, And so uh, I was able to do that. So the thing is, look many different places that you could find uh, the possibility, like I said, through your schools and, uh, and, and on uh, the internet. Also, the possibility through any of the, the bar associations. That's another opportunity to, to outreach. And also at the end of the day, this is, is reality. If you need money and you find if you feed, find a job that can do some work, do it. Because I actually, you know what I did when I was in John Jay? I worked full time as plain so close to security at the gap. I still ended up graduating 3.8. So I got out, I went to Fordham Law School. Uh, I'm now part of a law firm. It, that's just I'm saying you had yeah I, I had a, I had a, I had to live, and and when we were talking about the LSAT before I just want to chime on that. Surprisingly, nobody plugged the pre-law program. Were fantastic stuff that uh, that John Jay is doing about the LSAT because back then in basically the dinosaur age, I bought a Barron's book and studied for the LSAT on the train going to work between John Jay and there. And I knew I had a target, and back then it was like basically as basically as Arlo was talking about having your uh, your diverse experience and, and doing that. I knew that, so I was like, I need a target of 150. That's what I need, and that's going to open the doors. And I got that just studying on my own. I do not recommend that anybody do that, but that was just tough times. But it's, it goes to the idea: find these opportunities whenever you can. And in this crisis, go out there and look for them. Right, look for those opportunities, and because the worst thing anybody can ever say to you is no. And trust me, I've had a lot of no's throws at me, and at jobs and anything else. But you just still keep on going. Stephen, while I have you here, congratulations on your presidency, your president-elect uh, position. Can you talk to the audience a little bit about what is a bar association? What are these different um, culturally based bar associations? What are the benefits? What do they do for for you as lawyers? All right, uh, as the Puerto Rican Bar Association was created in 1957, and that was basically the pioneers in the Latino legal community in New York. And of ones, and it basically had some predecessors before them, but actually to become formed. And a lot of it, it was multifaceted. It was a growing, of course, Latino community in New York, Puerto Rican community in New York, but also facing the legal issues and also needing to have a voice in how to, in the representation, across the board about, and of course, besides the uh, judiciary and the legislative and uh, of that nature. And so that's, that was basically the history of what these organizations do. 
But then there's also what these type of organizations do is they create a lifeline for you. And it's a network of, of individuals who have similar experiences and know have gone things before. So the benefit in our just communities who go to our schools, there's many different facets. You know, we would call it like the royalty. The, the, there might be some of us in these communities who've actually had multiple years. You know, their grandparents went to college. You know, everybody on the board now, on this, the, uh, the speakers now, we're all first generation college. Like my sister and myself were the first in our whole family to go to college. So, but, and then you have people just, they too. And so that you have in these bar associations that come from all these different backgrounds and all these different experiences and throughout wherever you're going to be, because not necessarily as we talk about with Zyla going to school out there, you might like it and go out there, but there's, guess what? There's uh, bar associations, affinity bar associations that necessarily you might have, uh, you know, the Latino affiliation. There's actually different breakdowns, you know, the historically, like the uh, National Bar Association of New York is one of the, the oldest bar associations here for African Americans, but they also have other subsets, uh, like a Haitian Bar Association. And what the importance of this is, is there is a con you have a connection there, and it's easier to reach out to folks from your end as students. And rarely you will find somebody who is at these associations who will turn you back. They will always talk to you. So anybody who like from John Jay, or if I know somebody who I meet from a student from the PRBA who wants to have lunch with me, I do. Or we have coffee just to talk because these are connections that you're gonna have for your entire career. And that's one of the things is about the importance of these bar associations. Because when you're talking about going in, you're in get, either a high school student going into John Jay, as I was crazy to uh, think about, or to law school, we're talking about 20, 30 years down the, the road of these experiences and these connections that you have that might not only be people who you get jobs from or people you might actually have get business from, but people that might give business, you know, hire your kids. And so though that's, that's the benefit of these associations. And that's what we have to think about who us who have this first opportunity of this door is open to us of how greater a world we have experienced and now in these resources. And that's why I think it is a perfect bookend to what John Jay is now to when I went there, of how many more programs in the last 20 some odd years they have now that didn't exist back then. And just imagine the next 10 years or 20 years, what programs they'll even have more have. Because at least from our point of view, and we have to understand for anybody who's in there, just for months, 90% of all lawyers in the United States are white. You do the little breakdown, just so I'm speaking about from the Latino community, only 4% of, of all, all attorneys in this country are Latino. And only 1.8% of all partners are like myself, partners in law firms. And then one thing that's a daunting number, but it also gives you a sense of responsibility, that anytime somebody's gonna reach out to me who was in my, my seat years ago, I have an opportunity to connect and help. And that's how all these organizations are based on. And that's why we've, they're decades long, that they've come on. And the DBA, who's come on the last 20 some odd years, you know, also the last 40, you know, six years. So, and that's how it's happened. And that's how it's continued to grow. And that's why it's important because you don't, it's not necessarily for immediacy, frankly, it's for life. And of how you make those connections. Thank you so much. This is leading me to my next question and I can hear the passion in your voice and really the importance of networking and mentorship. Um, I see that as kind of a, a secondary layer to what you're talking about, Stephen, because these bar associations provide a network and I would imagine that within the bar associations there are mentorship opportunities. And I want to go back to Rosemarin, who spoke about the, um, the founding director of the uh, pre-law institute, Viel Cajones, who was actually on the search committee who hired me. So we both have a great deal of admiration and love for Vielka. And she used to tell me, a lot of people are asking about what majors. It, I mean, you guys can correct me if I'm wrong, but the major in college doesn't quite matter as much as you think it, it does. 
um, she used to say that you don't have to be pre-law to go to law school. You could be a philosophy major, a history major. One of the things she did tell me was it's very important for you to know how to write. So if you know that that's a weakness in your skill set, start thinking about how you can improve on that. So Rosemary, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the importance of her mentorship or mentorship in general and how important is it to network within um, the legal profession to continue your career in, um, you know, in terms of your ambitions? Yeah, absolutely. Um, definitely agree with um, your point about writing. I mean, the single most important attribute that you will have as an attorney is your ability to write clearly and concisely. And um, like Roseanne said, if you do feel like there's a deficiency, really spend time on correcting that. Um, if you don't, it will hinder performance in the future. And this is something that Bianca would tell me. And it would often come, you know, as a very harsh piece of advice, but I'm so happy that I had someone early on to, to tell me these things. So, uh, you know, the benefits of mentoring, especially when you are the first, uh, you're, you're the first uh, navigating uncharted waters, uh, you want to make well-informed decisions. You want to make sure that you're considering the pros and the cons of every step that you take. So the best thing that you can do is go to a seasoned, well-experienced person that has been through that path, that can guide you, that can tell you their lessons learned. You don't have to make all of the mistakes yourself. You can learn from other people's uh, you know, lessons learned. And um, just with regards to networking, um, I mean, when you take on an internship or a volunteer opportunity or, or any kind of experience that you, you take on, um, your goal should always be to become that indispensable worker, that person that adds value to the team, that makes contributions, that um, enhances everyone's experience, not just from a professional level, but from a personal level, someone who is kind, who is respectful, easy to work with. These are things that people look for when they're gonna hire you. They think about who you are as a person, but of course, your writing, your ability to articulate yourself, these are also uh, skills that you, you, know, you should focus on. Um, with regards to uh, just taking on internships and, and the longevity of that, so in the legal profession, um, especially if you plan to stay in New York, the legal community is very small. Um, everyone knows each other. At some point, you are gonna cross paths. So your goal should always be, you know, in addition to becoming the indispensable worker, is to uh, maintain those relationships along the way. Um, there will come a point where someone who, you know, was your mentor becomes your colleague. Um, there could be um, just, uh, you know, you can become the mentor to your colleague's child, you know, like the journey is long and um, always keeping that in mind and not uh, treating your experiences in increments uh, because it is, a, it is a lifetime journey. If you plan to practice law or even if you go outside of, you know, uh, the actual practice and do some type of policy work, you will be like, it's likely that you will be working with, um, you know, the people that you've, you've encountered. Um, and just with regards to like what your responsibility will become when you become an attorney, you know, our client, our duty is to represent uh, the, the clients that we serve. But I personally think that an additional duty is to develop our community and to and make the investments that were made uh, for you along the road, down the road. Um, and that could mean in whatever capacity that you can. Um, and I know that, you know, a lot of you who are watching are sort of uh, in the preliminary stage and you're considering, you know, if this is the right route for you, um, which I commend you again, because I, I think this is really important for you to collect this data from all of us, make, you know, a determination as to, you know, if this is the route you want to take and you know follow your heart and and follow your vision and mentors i think um can add value to you know the plan of you identifying what your vision is um they can share you know their successes in their careers and that's something that you know you should take into consideration now even if you're not in not you haven't started intern your internships or you know you're about to do that um, my, the mentorship that I got from Bioka was invaluable. And I've had the privilege of, 
you know, um, meeting many mentors after her um, at my law school. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons actually why I picked New York Law School was because um, they had a great clinic in immigration uh, led by our professor Lenny Benson, who is a guru in immigration. And, um, you know, her guidance in the practice area of what, you know, I was getting into was extremely invaluable because up until that point, no one had given me that specific specialized piece of advice about what are the types of classes and what are the types of exposures that I want to have before I make that commitment to immigration and um, courses, externships, experiences, and maintaining real relationships, not looking at what you can gain, but actually developing genuine relationships that are fruitful and that are mutually beneficial. Thank you so much, Rosemary. Yes, absolutely. I think one of the important things when you're thinking about networking and mentorship is that you just have to put yourself out there. You, um, I think Steven said earlier, the worst you could hear is no. And the answer is always no, unless you ask. At least if you ask, you have a 50% chance of getting a yes. So you have to put yourself out there. You have to um, look for the role models. You know, sometimes mentorship is already happening for you and you don't even realize it. You just have to kind of keep your eyes open and your ears open. Um, there's already people taking you under their wing and you're like, oh, wait a minute, maybe after today's conversation, you'll realize who they are and you'll start to utilize them more. Um, so we have so many questions <laughs> about getting into law school and the LSAT. But if you're a John Jay College alum or a John Jay College student, I'm going to refer you to the Pre-Law Institute. They can answer all of those questions. And as a matter of fact, they just opened the applications for the Summer 2020 LSAT prep program. You do have to apply. Um, 2019 and 2020 alums are eligible. But even if you don't fit into that eligibility, they will always take your questions no matter what year you are at John Jay and no matter what year of alumnihood you are in. They will always answer your questions. So I highly recommend, particularly these very specific questions about what should my LSAT grade be? How much should I study? The Pre-Law Institute is the place to go for that information. They are excellent at what they do. I mean, competent beyond competence. So I do wanna leave those questions for you to go ask them. And also it's an opportunity for you to network with them and reach out to them. I want to, um, we're coming close to an end, but I don't want to end the conversation without asking a final set of questions to each of our panelists. And I want you, if you don't mind, to tell us about what has been the biggest challenge, the most rewarding aspect, and then any final words you have for our audience. So we'll start with Steven, since you're the first one I'm looking at it, uh, on my grid. Oh, sorry. The challenge is, obviously, and as it relates to, uh, I'm actually gonna put them all together. Okay. Is, in a sense is, what I would say to you and everybody on this call, uh, on this, uh, <clears throat> and this webinar is that there's two things and it's related is always bet on yourself. If you don't bet on yourself, nobody else, uh, nobody else will. And you have to be relentless in this process. You have to be that nothing you get, not, it doesn't matter as they, you know, those saying that how many times you get knocked down, it matters how you get, how many times you get up. And that's what it is in this process. And I think about the challenge, there's many different ch challenging challenges throughout my you know 20 year career and before then of going to uh going getting into you know john jay and working full time and going to school and one semester carrying seven class seven classes uh so i could actually graduate on time and then in law school and then when i was i was good in law school you know i had good grades in law school but i had what they called on-campus interviews in which you get every year i ended up in my three years having a total of three on-campus interviews well, a lot of my other classmates got a ton, and there's many reasons why. And me graduating from law school without a job, and knowing that I was all or nothing in passing the bar, and so I focused that summer on passing the bar. And then going through 
to, you know, passing the bar and, and being in a small law firm. And I thought that was going to be my whole life. And I enjoyed it. It was a David Goliath opportunity. And then uh, we, we survived many things, but then they went under 13 years later. And I had to start again at a 13 year associate. And I, I felt like a super senior in high school. And I had to reinvent myself. And I went to Jai. And I was like, once again, being relentless and betting on myself. And I went to Jai. And I had an opportunity to go to Ackerman. And I eventually became partner uh, three years ago. And so what that just shows, regardless of your story and how the different things, is about these challenges that you have, right? And the rewarding, uh, the rewarding thing, it, it, and there's so many different rewarding experiences. One is, is actually doing this, right? Getting connecting with, with everybody here, getting connected with the panelists, who, and you know, and everything else. That that is what is rewarding. And so, seeing this opportunity that my, you know, what I was doing in my career in the legal profession, that this is my small place that I'm holding, that I can create this opportunity or these ideas. And there was one thing I would just leave. I remember when I got out of law school in '99 and 2000. Uh, somebody mentioned as well. I talk about uh, uh, Latino Justice Pearl Depp. Back then, it was called uh, Pearl Depp, Puerto Rican Legal Defense and Education Fund. And back in two, from 2002 to uh, 2010, they had a, a program called How to Succeed in Law School. And it was open to Latino stu uh, law students incoming throughout, uh, throughout the whole tri-city uh, region. And I was one of the panelists and instructors. And I did that. And then years later, I would meet students from that. So I remember you from that. And it just blew me away. And people remembered me saying things then. And it just made, you know, it, it warmed me up to think about, oh my God, I actually touched somebody's life and I made something better for them. And so that's what the rewarding thing was all of us. We got to get to do in our, in, in our profession and in these experiences. So thank you again, Roseanne. Thank you, Stephen. Zoila, you're up next. That was wonderful. I don't even know how to follow up with Steven because everything that he said is so true. It touches on everything that we should be doing and that all of you should be doing. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges um, following up on what Steven was saying is actually doubting yourself because of everything that we discussed, how we come from a background that is not no lawyer. Uh, we are first generation you know, Latinos in the US. Um, and thinking that because your parents are not attorneys, judges, and do not have these positions that you will be unable to succeed in law school. And then doubting yourself as to like, you know, maybe I shouldn't apply to this job because I'm not qualified. You know how many people apply to jobs that are not qualified and they get the job? So it, it kind of gets you angry at some point when you have passed on on opportunities because you think that you should work on yourself to make yourself a better candidate. And like us as women, we do that a lot. We overthink, um, we try to check every box in those qualifications. And sometimes we talk ourselves from going after what you know, we want at the end. And, and just in general, you know, we doubt ourselves, right? I think I'm a pretty resilient person and I've always gone after what I've wanted, but I have had my moments where I have doubted myself. And it's for those reasons that we discussed. Um, so I think one of the main takeaways that you should take from here is that if we can do this, if we can go to law school and have successful careers, so can you. But when you do get to law school and you don't do well on one class, don't think that you won't do well in the next class. If you don't do well in one semester, don't think that you won't do well in the second year. Because one of the things that I did in law school was that I doubted myself the first semester. And then second year and third year, I began to relax. I began to take courses that I was like excited about. And I began to like realize what my assets were. And I killed it. I did really well my third year because I basically took whatever I wanted to uh, take when it came to those courses. So don't doubt yourself and just push through um, and don't let anything hold you back. So that would be like one of the challenges that I had to overcome. Um, one of the rewarding experiences have been recently, you know, again, um, 
I've been trying to work on my professional career and getting to a place where I wanted to be. And I, I was lucky enough to finally get to the AG's office, which is where I wanted to be for a very long time. Um, but now I'm giving back, right? Um, and it, there's never, it's never too early to give back. Um, and I've been lucky enough to be involved with Latino Justice, as Stephen uh, mentioned, and it's a great nonprofit. Um, they actually have a, a law bound day coming up. Um, they have pre law courses, and I have volunteered as a mentor. And if you need mentors, you should reach out. Um, it's a great resource. And as just as people, um, I get emails from students. Um, do you want to meet? Do you want to talk? And I always meet with them. So do not think that, don't be afraid to ask because there's a lot of us out, a lot of us out there who will never say no. Whether it's a conversation, where there is an in-person meeting, just make sure that you build those connections. Um, and the main tech takeaway that I would like to say to everyone, build genuine, meaningful relationships. Because when you build genuine, meaningful relationships, it will carry on for the rest of your lives. Some people go out there and they think that you have to make an ask and you don't have to make an ask when you meet someone. And the most beautiful thing about that is they will come for you and they will help you out without you knowing or without you asking because you build those meaningful relationships. Uh, so never think about what you can get from someone. Always just build a relationship and let that you know take you wherever it may take you. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Laura? Thank you. So I would say my biggest challenge, challenge uh, throughout my um, undergrad and I would say um, law school experience has been uh, standardized tests. And I bring that up because I want to circle back to that LSAT. I was one of those people that I could have gotten good grades in my class because it's something like Zoila said, I could control. So I took advantage of every opportunity that I could in areas that I could control. So for example, if you have a class where you're not doing too well, it never hurts you to speak to the professor and ask for extra credit. Can I do something to make up for that grade? Um, and the process you're also learning. And so what I did was also, I took courses to help me for the LSAT. So critical thinking courses, those, those do help you. I took a logics course at John Jay. Um, that definitely helped me with the LSAT, the games uh, section. I loved it, the logic games, oh man, it was one of my favorites. And I think it was because I felt well prepared. If anything, it was my strongest section uh, in the LSATs. And so that's what I did to try and prepare for it. Uh, what I also did is I took a course um, with Kaplan at the time. I paid for that course, I did it for a summer. For some reason, I just, I, I wasn't too familiar with the John Jay um, LSAT prep course at the time. So I went with Kaplan and I was not scoring what I wanted to score. And again, I was a pretty bad standardized test taker. And I decided to take a year off uh, and work and study for the LSAT. So that's what I did to try and become a little bit more competitive. Why? Because even though, let's say um, you don't score where you want to score, that's fine. But you want to try. And what I thought was, okay, if I could try to get a great LSAT score, it helps me for two things. How is it relevant? One is you get into law school. And second, you could get a scholarship. If you get that scholarship or a partial scholarship, then it's less of a, that financial hassle um, when going into law school. So I ended up doing that and I got a partial scholarship at uh, St. John's, which helped out for my first year. I lost it for the second one because I didn't like my first semester in law school. And actually I thought about dropping out because I lost my confidence. After my first semester, while I was studying, I had not even gotten my grades yet, but you realize that you're competing with all alphas in law school all right it's you're in a whole a whole different ball game and so i remember crying to my mom I, when i was studying for my finals that first semester why because i said i don't really think i like this i i'm not enjoying the process um it's tearing me down and i think i just want to quit and she told me she's like you know what Laura, just get through the exams and then you can decide right after surely enough i did well after my first semester but um, I, it was just that fear, that fear of thinking that I could not perform because overall I was not good with taking these tests. And, um, and so that's what I did. I took that year off. I, I, I performed uh, better 
in my LSAT and I got accepted to law school and then I got that partial scholarship. And I, and I was very thankful for that. I even, I thought about taking, maybe going another year off and getting a higher score to go for a full ride. But then I balanced it out and I thought, you know what, the money I will make as a salary, as a lawyer, will just make up for that year I'm losing out. That's kind of the way I played it out. You balance it out, what works best for you. But um, the second challenge, challenge has been that financial, um, the financial situation I was in where my parents could not help me, my, with, help me with my education. I had to finance my entire law school education. And I will have to say that I've heard some people say this and I would say myself too, I'm not sure if I want to go to law school because it's expensive. And if I have to take out all these loans, how am I going to pay this back? But I got into this mindset where I said, you know what? I'm going in and I'll figure that out later on. I've been practicing. I'm going into my sixth year now. Last year, after five years, I was fortunate enough to be able to pay it off. I never thought, and I'm talking about I'm nearly $200,000 plus interest, and I never thought I would be able to do it. Again, I only bring it up because it's doable. Have a hope in yourself. Know that you could kick butt out there once you start practicing. Um, you know, I was very much of a go-getter in the sense that when I started working back as a personal injury lawyer, my base salary was not good. If you look out there, plain side personal injury salary, first year on, not good. You have to look for ways to supplement that. So what did I do? I looked for ways that I could balance that out. How can I make more? And I found th that area where I was like, okay, I need to bring in business. Let me look for clients. Let me bring in more clients. I brought in more clients. That's how I was able to target that challenge, that financial challenge that I had going into law school. And for all the students out there, if if that's the case for you, just think about it. Um, I don't want to be the person, I, I don't want you to say, okay, uh, I'm not going to worry about it. No, you do want to think about it. And also when you're applying for these loans, think about the interest rates. When you graduate, think about consolidating. As a matter of fact, the Puerto Rican Bar Association, since I'm chair of the students committee, we're putting together a, um, a webinar on how to pay off your student loans. And we're gonna have someone, um, her name is Cindy, and she's gonna talk about how she paid off her student loans after four years um so that's something you may want to look out for but don't let that um shy you away from following this path thank you so much laura if you wouldn't mind sending me the flyer for that i'll share it with the participants today definitely um, and also for students are uh, your membership for the prba and other associations it's free so you can sign up you get their emails and that's how you get more information so take advantage of that thank you so much and before we go to Rosemarin, Soyla said something about it's never too early to give back. And I see that there's some chatter about it in the chat, but I wanted to say that Rosemarin established a scholarship um, in honor of El Cajonis for an undergraduate who is aspiring to go to law school. So I recommend to those of you who are at John Jay College, check out the scholarships page. She is one of our donors and one of our youngest donors. So, you know, we, we're very grateful to her for that. And it could, um, it could really help one of you who's in the audience today. So be sure that you research that opportunity um, for the coming semesters. And Rosemarin, if you have some, you want to do some closing words and, you know, if you want to share any challenges and rewards. Yeah, of course. Um, thank you so much. Um, so just starting with challenges, um, and I'm so happy that we're actually ending with this because as much as I, I want to inspire everyone, my, my intention is that everyone is also aware of the realities of, of this journey. I think it was one of the most beneficial uh, pieces of advice that I got throughout the process. So um, I would summarize it as just having to adjust to change at every single step. When you're in college, when you get to law school, when you're taking the bar, when you become a new attorney, Every level requires you to become that much more disciplined, that much uh, your work ethic needs to increase. You need to be uh, more strategic and you have to sort of um, intentionally plan out your life. For example, um, and, and I feel like I've heard a Supreme Court justice by the name of Sonia Sotomayor who, who spoke on this very point that there will never be a transition that is more difficult than that of adjusting to law school. Um, but I, just from you know, my own experience, I would add that the preparation to law school is so challenging. 
Um, even with all the resources that you have, there is the self-doubt component. There is the statistical component, the fact that you're entering a profession that is very, uh, lacks diversity. And, you know, one of the reasons why I created that scholarship was to address that. Diversifying the bar is like a very big priority for me. I think the numbers mm -hmm. are very disappointing uh, in 2020 uh, to see how there is such little diversity uh, just across the board, uh, private sector, the government sector, nonprofit sector. Um, so your presence, you're adding a number there. Uh, so it, it, it is valuable. But um, with regards to law school um, and entering that environment, so if you're a John Jay alum um, or a John, you're currently a John Jay student, um, I'm going to go on a whim and say that you have had, you, you feel the sense of community. John Jay is a very unique institution where there is a sense of camaraderie. There is this common shared uh, uh, feeling of educating for justice, uh, very like-minded individuals in this community. When you go off to law school, uh, the community is a lot smaller. There's a lot more competition. The dynamic is different. And even if at the essence of who everyone is as a human being, we're the same, we have shared experiences that are very, very different from the people that we will encounter in law school, but also in the legal profession. So being aware of that and understanding that, that there's no way around that and building yourself um, and building the resiliency that you need to sort of navigate through that and not letting it um, have any negative impact on your ability to uh, perform academically is very important, um, as well as just um, asking for help. Um, one of the, the challenges that I had, I want to say, like in my first semester was uh, transitioning from college to, to, to a law student. I, in John Jay, I felt like a stellar student. I had an amazing GPA. I had extensive ex externship experiences. I graduated um, and I went off to per, uh, complete a prestigious fellowship with the mayor's office. Like I felt like in my prime. And when I get to law school and on my first day, I kid you not, I did feel like an alien who landed in an unknown planet. Um, and, and this is someone who prepared, had mentors. I was still taken back by how different uh, my environment was. And I did not ask questions, I want to say for a good month. And that was not a thing for me. Like my professors would kick me out of their office at John Jay because I wouldn't leave. I, I just wanted to talk about papers and philosophy and, and you know, analyze dif different issues for hours. I could do that. But in law school, for some reason, it took me a while to get back to that. And it was because I felt like admitting that I needed help was admitting that I was failing. And it took me a long time um like throughout that first semester to understand that admitting that you need help is actually taking sense of pride in yourself because you in acknowledging that you have a weakness and that you want to do something about it it shows that you know you have confidence that you have the courage to address these issues early on that you know you're going to need in the future so um, that was like you know a very big challenge the challenges are never ending i'm an immigration lawyer I feel like what I do is an extreme sport right now, um, just navigating the constant changes in this administration. Uh, last week, there was a tweet that went out confirming that President Trump wanted to suspend immigration, and then we got an executive order three days later. So for three days, every immigration lawyer in the United States was freaking out and not knowing what was going to happen. So that's sort of the, the climate right now. Um, and, you know, the profession has its challenges, but um, as long as you stay true to yourself and define what success means to you, um, I think that that is a key. There are a lot of, you know, you're going to get a lot of advice. You're going to hear from people who are going to have different takes on what success is and may encourage you to do something that you don't feel in your gut that you want to do, but you think it's going to make you look good. You know, it's going to be good resume booster. I always uh, discourage that. I feel like you, you take the information, you, you collect the data, you make a list of the pros and the cons, what you're going to be losing if you take this route or what you're going to gain, and then make the decision that resonates most with your passion and your interests. 
and stick to that because um, down the road when you're, you know, when you're in a practicing for years, um, your work is going to become mundane. I mean, I'm three years in and I think it's because I work in a high volume environment and um, it's very fast paced. And as passionate as I am about immigration, it becomes mundane. And what is going to give you, what's going to wake you up every morning and what's going to keep you going is knowing that you're adhering to that vision that you had for yourself, that what you're doing is define, defines what personal success means to you. So staying true to yourself and asking for help. Um, the, starting the scholarship this year was, of course, so, so rewarding for so many reasons. Um, I hope to create, and um, you know, we selected a, a recipient, and my goal is to continue the scholarship for years to come. As long as I'm alive, we're gonna have that going um, because I'm so indebted to the John Jay community. I'm indebted to um, my mentor who I created an honor for. And I really believe that diversifying the bar is you know, part of my responsibility as an attorney and um, extending my support to you know, everyone who's watching is all that I wanna do. It's, it's very rewarding. Of course, working in immigration uh, even if it's from the corporate perspective, comes with uh, lots of rewards. Um, I actually got my first DACA approved today, which is very nice. It's not something that I generally do, but just given the attention that it's getting and the importance of protecting that population, it does mean so much. But what really keeps me going is knowing that I can serve as a mentor, um, that I can offer my lessons learned to all of you who are watching, and just to encourage everyone to believe in themselves. and. Don't wait for a title or for a position to be a leader in your community. You don't need that. You don't need anyone's validation. As long as you make that decision, you work hard, you're determined, you show your passion. I guarantee you that the people around you will begin to support you and will guide you and make investments in your success. Thank you so, so much. I assure you there were only pros in coming to this webinar and having all of you as panelists. And I just gave everyone um, the ability to unmute yourselves so that we can give our folks a round of applause this evening for being with us tonight and extending their work day. Um, I know how busy everyone is with children and suddenly we have to work double from home for some reason. Um, so thank you so much. I'm indebted to all of you. Um, if there's anything ever that we can continue to do for you and those of you watching, um, as part of the John Jay family, please do not hesitate to contact us at alumni at jjay.cuny.edu. And I also just want to pitch one event that's coming up next Thursday at six o'clock. There is an alumni named Julia Wagner, and she is very steeped in law enforcement around animal welfare and zoos. And I mention it because it's so different, right? It's so different from what we're used to. And I want our community- I'm like, listen, I'm gonna give the hours that I work. Whatever you guys choose to do with it, that's what you do. <laughs>Yes, I want to invite all of you to that event if you can make it six o'clock next Thursday, Animal Welfare and Law Enforcement in Zoos. It's another way to think about criminal justice. It's another way to think about law enforcement and the legal profession. And it's just another avenue for people who still don't know which direction they wanna go when it comes to, to the law profession. So once again, thank you to all of you so much for being here and have a wonderful evening. Please stay safe and know that John Jay College will forever be part of your family. So thank you so much, everyone.